Jesus, kids, and you. We're going to begin a new series this week. You know, thinking about kids and thinking about children, as I've done a lot as I've been preparing for this series, inevitably my thoughts turn to parents, parents and their kids. And I came across some things that parents have said about their children, about parenting. Maybe you can relate to a few of these. For example, one thing I came across said, you know, the quickest way for a parent to get a child's attention is to sit down and look comfortable, <laughs> right? Maybe you've experienced that. Uh, or, or how about this one? You know, before I had kids, I didn't know I could ruin someone's day by just saying, get dressed, please right? Uh, or, or how about this? A two-year-old is like having a blender, but you don't have a top for it. Now, I'm not sure the limit there is two years old. I've seen some older kids and maybe even some adults uh, that that could apply to. How about this one? 90% of parenting is just thinking about when you can lay down again. Right, but if that one's true, then the math doesn't add up on this next one. 88% of parenting is saying it's bedtime 150 times between 8 and 9 o'clock every night. Right, can you relate to some of those things? Maybe if you're a parent, I was talking to my mom once and I said, Mom, am I adopted? And she said, not yet, but we've placed an ad. <laughs> okay, that one isn't true. She didn't actually say that. But uh, Now, this series, Jesus, Kids, and You, it doesn't actually have to do with parenting. That was just kind of my introduction there. What we are going to do is we're going to take four different times uh, where Jesus interacted with kids, or where at least a, a child was a part of the story in some way. Uh, four different occasions over the next four weeks. Uh, the first one, we're going to start in Matthew chapter 18. So if you have your Bibles there, you can pull it out or we're going to put the verse on the screen for you. Let's look at story number one where Jesus interacted with the child. Are you ready? Here we go. Matthew chapter 18, verse one. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, so who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Uh, this encounter with Jesus and a child begins with a question from the disciples. And that question that we just read, Jesus, which one of us is the greatest? Which one of us has done the most? Which one of us is bringing the most to the table, so to speak? Now, in, in the last two chapters, let me just set the stage for you here a little bit. In the last two chapters in the book of Matthew, we, we would have read and, and seen where, where Peter, like he, he confesses that Jesus is the Messiah. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 16, Peter said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And in chapter 17, we would have seen Peter and James and John witness the transfiguration of Jesus on the mountain. And so there's some pretty significant things that have been happening, and these disciples have been with Jesus for a little bit. And all these events that have been happening, they really could have led or contributed to this question that's just been asked of Jesus, right? Which one of us is the greatest? Like, was it the ones that saw you in your transfiguration? Was it the ones that have claimed that you're the Messiah? Which one of us is doing the most. And, and the disciples are, are probably wondering this and, and debating this among themselves, right? It's like, well, you ask him. Well, no, no, you ask him. Well, and, you know, finally someone says, all right, I'll do it. I'll, I'll do it. Jesus, which one of us is the greatest? They're, they're kind of asking the quiet part out loud here. And so what does Jesus do when he gets asked this question? How does he answer? Well, let's keep going. Verse two, he called a small child, and he had him stand among them. Jesus brings this child into this little huddle that they've got going on. And this is so great, Jesus' response. here. Here's what you need to know about kids at that time. Right? Like they had no rights. They were to be seen, not heard, right? Maybe you've heard that expression. Uh, they would have been looked down on. Nobody had time for kids. You couldn't be bothered with children. And Jesus, in response to their question, he goes and he gets this child, must have been standing somewhat close to him, goes and he gets this child and he brings the child right into the middle of them. And here's what he says, verse 3. Truly, I tell you, 
he said. Uh, unless you turn and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child, this one is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now, we really need to take notice of what Jesus just said here. Like There, there is a huge warning here. There, there's the kind of this key phrase in these verses, right? He says, unless, dot, 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 you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Right? Like the disciples start by saying, Jesus, which one of us is the greatest? And Jesus says, look, unless you do these things, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And I don't know about you, but when I would have heard that, I would have wanted to make sure I understood what Jesus said after the word unless, right? Like, you, like if we had been sitting there listening and Jesus said, unless you, and then maybe we got distracted and looked somewhere else or somebody started talking to us and then we tune back in and it ends with, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. We'll be like, oh, whoa, whoa, you know, uh, question, Un unless what? Uh, uh, unless, unless we do or don't, you know, what, what did he just say? Well, Jesus gives two related answers here. Uh, two things he gives them, uh, unless you turn and become like little children. And then he says, unless you humble yourself like this child. So what does that mean? Well, those two phrases, let's break these phrases down just a little bit. The first phrase, unless you turn and become like little children. That word turn is really kind of the key word here. Right? It means unless you change, or another trans Bible translation might use the word converted. Unless you convert, a turning, a change, there's a, there's a transformation that's happening here. We, we are to transform, to turn, to change, become like little children. Well, how do we do that? How do we, how do we become like a child? Well, let's, let's make sure we cover how not to, right? Because I, I think we can take this imagery a little bit too far, farther than what Jesus was intended here, intending. Uh, children have many characteristics that the people of God aren't supposed to copy, right? Like, you know, kids, and boy, if you're a child and you're listening to this, don't take offense at what I'm about to say. Uh, because quite frankly, a lot of this is true even of adults, okay? But we're focusing on kids here for just a minute. Kids, they don't, they don't know a lot, right? They're learning. That's why they're in school, things like that. Kids, they can't always focus very well on things for a long period of time. They, they can get distracted. Children often make poor decisions, right? There's this kind of this overall immaturity with kids, right? So I, I don't think we're to become totally like little kids. Well, then what, what did Jesus mean, right? How, how are we to become like little children? How are we to turn and become like a kid? Is it childlike faith? Is that what Jesus is talking about here? I don't think that's exactly it. Let's look at the second phrase that Jesus used. He said we are to humble himself or humble ourselves like this child. Well, what's the key word here? In the first phrase, the key word was turn. Here, I think it's humble. We would want to know that, right? What, what does Jesus mean by humble? Well, in this case, it's, it's more than a, a state of mind, right? Or more, it's more than just an, an action. You know, it's not, I'm going to be humble, right? Because think, he says, humble yourself like this child. Well, how, how often, let's just be honest here, how often do kids act humbly, right? Not, not always. And again, this is true of adults, quite frankly, in a lot of ways, but let's focus in on children. Children, they think usually that the world revolves around them. Right? And, and they, don't, they don't know much different. They don't always know that that's how they're, they're thinking. I, I wouldn't classify most kids as humble in that way. I, I remember growing up, uh, I was younger. I don't remember the exact age, but it would have been, you know, elementary age or something. And, I, and it was Mother's Day. And so that particular day, my dad had taken my two brothers and I, and we had gone to the store. I think we'd gone to a restaurant to pick up a meal that we were going to serve my mom for Mother's Day. And as a kid, this kind of boggled my mind, like, wow, we, we have a whole day to celebrate Mother's Day. And I know that coming up, we'll have a, a whole day to celebrate Father's Day. And so we're standing in line waiting for the food. And I said to my dad, 
this kind of seems unfair. Like, when are we going to have a kid's day? Right? Like, there ought to be a day where we celebrate kids. And my dad looks at me and he says, Joel, every day is kid's day. <laughs> and I didn't understand what he meant at the time, but now that I'm a parent, you know, I kind of get that. Right? You spend a lot of your days, most, if not all of your days, serving your kids. Every day is kind of a celebration of Kids Day. So, what did Jesus mean then by humble? Well, a better word here would be dependence. That would have been a uh, that would be a, maybe a better translation of this word. Remember, kids at this time they had no rights, right? No status, no importance. You couldn't be bothered with kids. And Jesus brings a child into the midst of their presence in this question of who is the greatest. And he says, humble yourselves or be dependent like this child or you'll never see the kingdom of God. And think about that for a moment. Think about the dependence that kids have on their families, right? Kids depend on their parents for everything, right? Especially kids at a young age. Think about that. Their food, their shelter, their clothes, medical needs, just love and care. The list goes on and on. Children depend on their parents. And even though the kids think the world revolves around them and every day is kids' day, kids are dependent on their parents for everything. So what is Jesus saying here? What is he communicating? He was just asked this question, Jesus, who among us is the greatest? Jesus, which one of us has done the best? Which one of us contributes the most? Which one of us brings the best talents and skills to the team? Which one of us is the MVP? Jesus, who is the greatest? And Jesus takes a child and puts the child in the middle of them and says, look, you don't get it. Like this child has to depend on his family for everything. You are depending on the wrong thing. You can't save yourselves. You're putting your confidence in the wrong place. You must depend fully. You must depend wholly on me for what it is that you need. Jesus is saying, I am here to save you. Depend on me. Don't depend on which one of you is the greatest. It's really easy for us to do the same thing as the disciples, isn't it? To put our confidence in ourselves, to depend on ourselves. We don't like to think that we need outside help. We don't like to ask for help. We love to be self-reliant. Asking for help hurts our pride because it's an acknowledgement that we can't do it all. We could use a hand. You know, like you ever seen somebody trying to carry something and you can just tell it's heavy and they're struggling with it and their life would be a lot easier if you came over and gave them a hand and you say, can I help, can I help you carry that here? Let me take some of that for you. No, 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 I got it. It's under control. Or maybe, you know, you've got some, some knowledge or expertise in a certain area and you say to someone, hey, if I can help you with that, let me know. Yeah, I'd be happy to come and help. And usually when we say that, that's true. Like, right, we'd be, we'd be honored to be able to come help somebody with that. They say, no, 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 I got it. And, you know, it's, or I'll, I'll figure it out. It's under control. Because we don't, sometimes we don't like to acknowledge that we need to depend on somebody else. And the same thing is true. This is what Jesus is talking about here. It's really easy for us to put our confidence in so many other things. And if we want to know where someone's confidence or dependence is, then watch what happens when it gets threatened or taken away. Right When suddenly we lose our health or the health of a loved one, or suddenly that savings account that we had built up is gone and depleted. Or we lose the job that we thought was secure. Or maybe we were in control or had, had power and suddenly that's gone. Or, or a relationship that we were depending on. And, and, and this thing that we had our confidence in suddenly isn't what we thought that it was. What happens to our soul and to our spirit when we were depending on that? Jesus is making the point to his disciples that dependence or confidence in anything other 
than him won't get you into the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because only total trust and dependence on God, like a child depending fully on their parents, will work. Here's the thing. right? We all depend on something. What better place to put your dependence than on the creator of the universe? By that I mean we, we all have something holding us up. Right? It could, we could be putting our dependence on God or it's going to be dependence and confidence in ourselves, something that we've built or something that we've made or just we think we can always handle things. We've got our dependence on something. So put our dependence in the creator of the universe. Here's just a few verses from Scripture that illustrate who God is and who we're putting our confidence in. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 13. For I am the Lord your God who holds your right hand, who says to you, Do not fear. I will help you. Psalm chapter 73, verse 26. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart, my portion forever. I lift my eyes toward the mountains. Where will my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And Jesus himself said in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, for the son of man has come to seek and to save the lost. That's really what this dependence thing is about. Right? Because there's some problems that our money can fix. There are some problems that having a good job can fix. But there is a problem that we all have that we can't fix ourselves, and that is the problem of sin. It, sin has left us in a broken state, and we don't like being there. So we try all sorts of things to solve it. We depend on all sorts of other things to get us out of this broken world. We depend on those things that we mentioned a moment ago, the money, health, career, relationships, fill in the blank. And these things that we depend on to fix this problem of sin that we have, that there will be a penalty for our sins, a payment that is required. These things that we depend on, they will let us down every time. And Jesus said, stop putting your dependence on those things that will always fail you. You're going to think that they'll work. This time is going to be different. But every time, it lets you down. I like to play golf. I don't know about you. Maybe you're a golfer. I enjoy getting out and playing. And if you don't know anything about golf, there's different clubs in the golf bag that you have. And depending on the kind of shot that you need to hit, you're going to choose a certain kind of club. And I have a club in my golf bag. It's called the, the lob wedge. Okay, this is a 62 degree lob wedge. Now what that means is uh, when the ball is sitting here, you can see uh, it's a pretty flat surface, right? There's, it's a pretty high loft. If you wanted to hit the ball far, you're going to turn it like this, or you'd have a club that would look like this, where the ball is going to go that way. Uh, if you had a higher lofted club, it's going to go higher. So the ball is going to come through, hit it here. It's going to hit the ball up higher. It won't go as far but it'll go higher. And you use this kind of club maybe when you're pretty close to the green where the flag is, but there's an obstacle in your way, maybe a, a sand trap or a little pond or something, and I need it to go up, but I, I don't need it to go very far. The thing is with this club, it takes a lot of skill to hit it. This is a really hard uh, club to hit. Uh, but I always think I can hit it. <laughs> uh, and so I carry this around with me. In fact, I had one. It wasn't this exact club, but I had a lob wedge like this, and I would carry it around, and I'd get in a situation, and i think, okay, this is a perfect shot for my lob wedge. So I would pull it out and get it, and in the back of my mind, you're like, this probably isn't going to go well. And sure enough, I would hit it, and it would just dribble out there, or go sideways, or just it never went where I wanted it to go. And I would think, why do I hit this club? 
Why do I depend on this thing? Because it, it never does what I want. And I would slam it back into my bag and wait. And sure enough, another time would come up at some point. I'd think, okay, this is the shot for this club. So I'd pull this out of my bag and I think, this time's going to be different. And I would go to hit it and it wouldn't go where I'd want. And I'd slam it back in my bag and, and march on. And eventually the shot would come again. Well, finally, I was playing a, at a course in Kentucky one time. And, and this situation came up and I get the lob wedge out and it doesn't do what I want. And I think, why do I hit this club every time? Uh, it doesn't do what I want. I'm so tired of hitting it. So you know what I did to make sure I didn't hit it again? Uh, I left it on the golf course. I actually took it, kind of tossed it a few yards, and then just walked away. And somebody at some point would have come up on that hole after me and found a lob wedge lying in the fairway because I said, you know what? I can't depend on this club anymore. I've just got to leave it behind because I kept trying to hit it. There's other clubs that I have in my bag that would do something different, but there was something about that that I thought I should be able to hit that, and it let me down every time. You know, Jesus said that he came to seek and to save. Jesus said he came to fix that problem, and he did. But why do we trust in other things? Jesus satisfied the punishment for our sin, just like he said he would do. On the cross, Jesus showed that he was worthy of our total dependence. And ask yourself, is, is your confidence, is it that of a child trusting the goodness of our Father, depending on our Father to solve the problems that we have, or have we put our confidence in, if we depended on ourselves. Let me take this golf analogy one step further. You know, what if there was this golf club, this golf course that you wanted to get into and play, but you couldn't? You didn't have the right requirements or, or you couldn't afford it. There's a place in Georgia, maybe you've heard of it, it's called the Augusta National Golf Club. And it's, it's a course that they hold a tournament there every year called the Masters. I have never been there, but it is, it's something to watch on TV. It's just beautiful and pristine. And when we moved to Georgia, one of my thoughts was, oh, I could go to the Masters golf tournament. Well, then I started researching ticket prices, and it costs a lot of money to get in just to watch that golf tournament. But there's a membership that they have at the club. And it, this is a close, like you, you, you just don't just like apply to get in to be a member here, right? One time my wife and I were staying overnight in Augusta, Georgia, the city where this golf club was. And I said, oh, you know, we're not that far from it. It would be fun just to drive by and look at it. And so we did. We, it was kind of cold and rainy that day. We were on the motorcycle. We rode to this golf club and kind of parked across the street and got out. And if you've ever been there, it, it's very closed off. Like that, you can't see anything except for this one driveway, Magnolia Lane, they call it. Uh, it, it that's the one entrance. Everything else has like tall uh, hedges and fences around it. It really quite frankly, it'd be easy to miss if you weren't looking for it. So we went and we stopped and we got out and there's this guard shack right there and they've blocked off the driveway. And, and, and I said, well, we could at least take a picture by it or something like that. But there was this thought, you know, there's kind of this idea of like, man, I would love to get in there. I would love to get in there and look at that, but I, I'm never going to get in. Uh, I don't have the right requirements. I don't have the, the right resume, so to speak. I'm not wealthy enough to get into that club someday. But here I was on the outside kind of looking in like, man, I'd, I'd love to get in there someday. But you know what? Jesus isn't like that. Any and all are welcomed in to the club, so to speak. Any and all can put their dependence and trust in the one and only thing that will never fail and will never let you down. And the best part is, unlike the golf club, there is no entry fee. There's no resume requirements. There's no prerequisites in order to put your dependence and put your confidence and your trust in God. Jesus welcomes all. In the same way, he took that child and put him in a place where they didn't really belong, into the middle of that group. Jesus welcomes you. Aren't you glad that we can be dependent, that Jesus invites us to put our dependence and our confidence in Him. 
if you're listening to this and you've never done that, you've never put your confidence and trust in Jesus Christ, ask yourself that question, what am I putting my confidence in? What's the one thing where if it was taken away tomorrow, my world would end? What's keeping me from putting my confidence and my dependence fully on Jesus? And if that's you and you've made that decision, I would encourage you just in the midst of this with two things. Number one, make sure you are putting your dependence fully on Jesus. That there is this, this sense of entitlement in our minds that somehow I'm, I'm bringing something to the table that I wouldn't be tempted to ask Jesus. Jesus, which, which one of us is the greatest? Is it me? That I am putting my dependence fully on Him. And the second thing I would encourage you with is to just take time this week to be thankful. To be glad that God gives us this opportunity. That God didn't rank us by, well, who is the greatest? And I'll take the top 100 into my club. He welcomes anyone from little kids up to aging adults. Put your confidence and dependence in Him. We'll look at another interaction that Jesus had with a child next week.